hello, um, my name is April Brown and I'm the Digital Outreach Coordinator for the Archaeological Conservancy. And I would like to welcome you all to our, our virtual lecture this evening. Um, our presenter this evening is a Southwestern archeologist and associate professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico. She specializes in the archeology span of Chaco Canyon and the greater ancestral Pueblo region with an emphasis on the topics of uh, social identity, ceramic technology, and personal adornment. She's written several articles and book chapters on the subject of personal adornment, including her most recent volume, Personal Adornment in the Construction of Identity, a Global Archaeological Perspective. I would like to welcome my former professor and mentor, Dr. Hannah Matson. Hello, Hannah, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, today for this talk, and thanks April for um, inviting me to be here um, to talk about my research. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of my more recent research on Kiva offerings from the site of Pueblo Benito and what the implications of the objects in these really special offerings um, might have for the way we understand Chacoan cosmology in terms of color directionality and sacred landscapes. So briefly, um, a little bit about me. Um, April covered a little bit of this already. Um, I am an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico, and I specialize in Southwest archeology. span My research interests include um, the ancestral Pueblo region, uh, the archeology span of Chaco Canyon, and particularly issues surrounding past identity and ritual performance. Um, much of my recent research over the last 10 years has really focused on um, ancestral Pueblo jewelry, especially Chacoan jewelry, um, and the relationship that personal adornment has in general to social identity um, in the past. So in the pre-Hispanic Southwest, um, objects that we would categorize as jewelry items were actually often placed in special contexts like ritual offerings. And so while my initial interest was in sort of bodily adornment specifically, um, it became obvious in the course of my work that these materials had a lot of social and spiritual value in this region in the past, as they still do today, um, which led me to sort of begin exploring other related topics, like how they may have been intertwined like, with past cosmology. So the assignment of specific colors to directions is actually a pretty common practice in traditional uh, societies around the globe. And while a range of different directional color groupings have been documented worldwide, those including sets of four are actually pretty widespread in Asia and the new world. So indigenous North American color schemes where they've been recorded at least, appear to be predominantly quaternary. So they involve uh, a fourfold division, which is sort of loosely approximated by the commonly recognized cardinal directions. More accurately, however, they correspond to what we called world quarters. So the boundaries between world quarters are different from our conventional kind of Western cartographic partitions. So when directional quadrants are referenced um, in modern context, it's often with respect to sort of these primary intercardinal points, so Northwest or Southeast. Um, so on the left here, you can see sort of the classic Western compass rows where the primary quadrants are defined along North, South and East, West axes um, with the intercardinal points located in the middle of these quadrants. World quarters, on the other hand, which you can see in this slide on um, the right hand side, typically encompass the cardinal direction that they're trying to reference. So um, in North America, the um, in traditional societies, the main four directional colors typically include white, red, yellow, and black, and not uncommonly blue or green um, are substituted for one of these basic colors. Um, and among numerous North American indigenous communities, 
including many of the Pueblos, blue and green are actually combined both conceptually and linguistically. So here you can see um, the quaternary directional color schemes um, for 78 different North American cases. And these were documented by archeologist Warren DeBoer. Um, and this is just a small sort of excerpt from, um, from his work um, that shows I think 39 different groups here. But basically he documented, you know, sort of which colors um, are assigned to which directional quadrant among each of these, um, in each of these communities. Um, and then here I sort of summarized his data just to sort of look at the distribution of, are there any patterns of, you know, um, which colors and which quadrants um, tend to be associated with each other. Um, and it's sort of interesting, there's actually quite a bit of variability in which specific colors are assigned to which directions um, across the continent, even though they typically include um, these four to five basic colors. So although um, the Pueblos are linguistically diverse, they speak eight different languages and new, numerous dialects um, therein, ethnographic research reveals that um, they share a broadly, um, they, they widely share an understanding of the cosmos as scenery, as having six divisions. So this includes the sort of four main directional uh, quadrants, north, south, east, and west, as well as a, um, a zenith or above and a nadir or below. And each of these is typically linked to one of five main colors again, white, red, black, yellow, or this blue slash green um, category, plus sometimes a kind of like a multicolored category or maybe a lighter or darker version of one of those main colors. Interestingly, um, among many of the Pueblos, these directions are also often associated with specific seasons, maybe specific animals and plants, sometimes important um, substances like tobacco or water, particular kinds of stones or seashells, um, although this really varies from community to community. Um, so it's clear from both the ethnographic literature and information shared by members of modern descendant communities that directionality really permeates traditional Pueblo life. This includes you know, the orientations of architecture, um, where shrines are placed, um, you know, where offerings are placed, um, but also more sort of intangible elements like um, uh, the way that prayers are made, the sort of directionality that that, that, that follows, uh, dances, processions, maybe song sequences, or even uh, ritual narratives. So given that there's an established ancestral connection between um, the Pueblos and the pre-Hispanic inhabitants of the Northern Southwest, and the archeological evidence we have that there are many underlying continuities between sort of pre and post contact period ritual practice, I think it's probable that the past residents of the region likely also shared some of these general ideas related to directionality and color. Um, and of anywhere in the ancestral Pueblo world where we see an attention to directional alignment, this is perhaps the most exemplified in the architecture of Chaco Canyon. The so Chaco Canyon is located in Northwestern New Mexico. It lies at the center of this really extensive ancestral Pueblo, what we think was this large social network um, that stretches across the larger Four Corners region. It encompasses over 100,000 square kilometers. And this network includes over 230 um, Chacoan style large masonry structures um, known as great houses and hundreds of ancient road segments. Here you can see in this, this map, um, all the dots and circles, these are, these are all Chacoan uh, great houses across the region. So uh, Chaco Canyon, um, for those of you who, who've been lucky enough to go, uh, you know what I'm talking about here. For, the, for those who have not yet gone, I, I strongly encourage you to, it, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so the first distinctive architectural elements of the Chacoan system 
first uh, appeared in the canyon, actually at the beginning of the 10th century, so the 900s AD, and reached their greatest sort of elaboration in geographic extent by the 12th century. So although there's this huge distribution of great houses in the northern and southwest, the canyon itself contains a concentration of very large great houses. Um, it contains 15, the largest of which is Pueblo Benito. So this is Pueblo Benito. Um, it's this sort of D-shaped structure you see here from above. It's estimated to have had between 600 and 800 rooms um, at its height, and it stood up to four stories in places. It was first built in the late 80, um, 800s and reached its height by around 80, 1100. In addition to its just sheer size, um, it's also uh, unique in terms of its, um, it has two elite mortuary crypts, um, caches of unique um, ritual objects and goods imported from across the Southwest and Mesoamerica. So all of these indicate that Pueblo Benito probably served as some kind of cultural or ceremonial hub for its surrounding region. Now, the site has been the focus of archeological research for over a hundred years. Um, there's actually archeology span being done of the early archeologists now even. Um, the structure is fully excavated. Um, this was completed through two large um, projects one in the 1920s and one in the 1890s. So these are the Hyde Exploring Expedition um, sponsored by the American Museum of Natural History and um, the National Geographic Society Expedition, which was completed in partnership with the Smithsonian. So this is why um, most of Pueblo Benito's material culture, most of the artifacts are largely housed um, in museums on the East Coast. It's sort of you know, a result of this um, sort of history of excavation. So beginning in the 1970s, uh, researchers noted alignments and patterns in the spatial distribution of structures in the canyon. Um, Archaeoastronomer Anna Sofer documented alignments between um, great houses and certain solar events. In addition to the now famous uh, sun dagger spiral petroglyph, which is on the side of Fajada Butte, uh, which stands in the bottom of Pueblo Benito, I mean, uh, Chaco Canyon, I'm sorry. Um, and this petroglyph appears to mark solstices, equinoxes, and perhaps even lunar standstills. And then Pueblo Benito itself is oriented along cardinal axes. It has that large sort of the straight part of that D shape um, that south or front wall extends east-west and it's aligned with sunset um, and fall equinox. And then it has that very conspicuous interior dividing wall that runs north-south. Um, and then the pueblos in the canyon also appear to be arranged in relation to each other. Um, the sort of reflecting what's been called perhaps a kind of sacred geometry that incorporates not only the structures, but also like roads, um, other kinds of ceremonial features, but also the natural landscape. So given this ad intense attention to directional alignment in Pueblo Benito's architecture, um, the presence of these formal and uniform circular ritual structures known as kivas at the site, and the presence of deposits um, in kivas um, that include materials of different colors. I think that Pueblo Benito's Kiva offerings are kind of an ideal case study to examine Chaco and concepts regarding color um, and direction. So Pueblo Benito contains 35 kivas. Again, those are these sort of semi-subterranean um, structures you see here. Um, more than any other Chaco and Great House in the Northern Southwest. Um, the Kiva form is um, found widely in the ancestral Pueblo region. Um, it has actually very deep historical roots. So between about um, 6500 um, BC and 8700, so before the really widespread appearance of above ground residential architecture in the region, people typically lived in pit structures, these sort of ovoid to circular shaped pit structures or pit houses. 
And over time, we see that these features sort of increase in formality um, and that sometimes offerings were placed between uh, under the floors or in little compartments in the walls or sometimes um, little storage bins or even in uh, ventilator tunnels. And then after residential occupation sort of shifted to above ground pueblos um, in this part of the Southwest, it appears that the pit structure form sort of became the focus of ceremonial activities. And so this could be due to their connection with sort of ancestral times. Uh, in most Pueblo origin stories, humans are thought to have emerged from underground through a series of vertically stacked worlds. So it's sort of tempting to interpret kivas as sort of symbolically representative of both an earlier architectural form and this aspect of traditional history. So although this basic kiva form, it's found throughout the ancestral Pueblo region, um, the specific architectural elements um, in these structures vary by geographic location. Chacoan kivas are divided into three main categories by archeologists. This includes uh, what we call great kivas, court kivas, and room block kivas. So great kivas, are the largest, these are 10 to 20 meters in diameter and could have accommodated you know, the most sort of ritual participants. Um, and great house communities generally only have one or two great kivas. And this sort of suggests that maybe they served as locales of sort of large scale ceremonial activity or maybe communal um, activity. Apart from their just massive sizes, great kivas in Chaco are also uh, distinguished by a series of distinctive architectural traits, including roofing structures that are supported by four absolutely massive timber posts um, and a distinctive set of interior features that we don't see in the smaller uh, kivas. So for example, like an interior bench um, that rings the interior perimeter um, that it looks like it probably served as um, for seating um, and then these wall niches here, you can see these little um, square um, sort of features around the interior, these little wall niches um, that would have originally contained offerings. Um, and some of the great kivas in the canyon appear to be aligned to solar events, um, such that you know roof or wall openings actually channel light into the interior of the structures in really distinctive ways, particularly on summer solstice. However, there are two other kinds of kivas, smaller kivas um, known as court kivas and room block kivas. So these are much smaller. They're about four to eight meters in diameter and they are located um, in sort of plaza spaces or even within rooms themselves. Um, and these are much more numerous at Chaco and Great Houses than Great Kivas. So of Pueblo Benito's 35 kivas, almost 80% share a suite of really specific architectural traits that define what have been termed court kivas. This is a term coined by uh, Chaco archeologist, Tom Wines. And um, these features include, here you can see a little plan view of the major features. And I'll be showing you a picture of court kivas in, in just a moment here. Um, these low masonry roof support pillars known as uh, pilasters, and they're sort of denoted here, you can see, and they actually sit on top of this interior bench. Um, they all have a ventilator tunnel that is oriented to the south or very near to south. Um, many have the sort of prominent little recess in the northern portion of the bench. Um, they have a circular fire pit either right in the middle of the structure or just sort of in the south central portion of the floor. And a, uh, a rectangular, what we call subfloor vault um, that's to the west of the fire pit. Um, so room block kivas are defined by both their small sizes, but then the lack of these distinctive features. So most of my research, most the rest of today's talk is gonna focus on these court kivas. Okay, so here you can see um, a picture from the 1920s. Um, um, this is an excavated 
uh, Court Kiva in Pueblo Benito. Um, so as I said, the, the pilasters are these pillars that, are, that sit on top of the interior bench. So here is this bench that's going around the interior. Here you can see these masonry pilasters are distributed around the bench. And they would have served as the supports for the lower um, portions of crib log roofs. So there are these dome superstructures comprised of estimated like 150 to 300 timbers, all of which would have had to have been imported, carried into the canyon. Um, and so they would have been stacked in courses. And so these pilasters basically served as, to, as their lower support structure. And here you can see that lower portion of the, of the log roof actually still intact on the top of these pilasters. Um, here you can see an example of an intact portion of an amazingly well-preserved uh, cribbed kiva roof um, at a site in southeastern Utah. So totally different area, but just to give you an idea of the roofing structure here, you can see these different layers um, of timbers comprising the roof structure. And again, the lower course is sitting on these sort of masonry pillars. Now, at the core of each of these pilasters is a shortened portion of a log that's oriented parallel to the bench surface. And this is why they're called actually radial log pilasters. Here you can see the end of one of these logs, right? So it's, it's laying uh, parallel to the bench surface. And these, these logs, these sort of sections of logs were then covered in sandstone masonry. And then that would have been covered in plaster. So here you can see one of these radial log pilasters still with its layer of plaster on. Um, and during these um, early excavations, it was found that most of these pilasters contained offerings. Um, they were placed in these small little um, adobe topped cavities in the top of the radial logs. So here you can see this is actually by this bent spoon here, you can see sort of make out this little circular plug. So inside of that would have been a little repository where offerings were placed. Um, so these deposits would have been completely inaccessible once the structure was constructed. Um, literally, they are placed at the very foundations of these really heavy, expensive roofs, um, which indicates that they were probably placed, or they were definitely placed during construction and likely served as sort of dedicatory offerings um, for, these, for those kivas. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the majority of Palo Benito was excavated 100 or more years ago. So working with legacy projects like this and their collections kind of presents unique challenges in terms of the amount of detailed documentation that's available, um, particularly considering you know, that this was really at the infancy of scientific archaeology. But fortunately for my study, both of the big excavation projects, both the Hyde and the National Geographic projects, generally did assign unique numbers to these pilasters within these, these kivas, and that this, um, these numbers stayed with the objects that were found in those pilaster offerings. So that was very fortunate. It was a bit tricky though, in that the pilaster numbers were not shown on any of the published figures, right? So the, the, key, the, the plan view of the kiva would be published, but you know, which one is pilaster one, which one is pilaster seven? Um, but I was able to reassociate it using field notes and um, old photos, um, field sketches, um, things like that. So um, I was able then to assign the objects that were placed in each of these pilasters and uh, with their original orientation within the structure. So in all, I was able to determine the orientations of about 140 pilasters in 22 different court kivas at the site. And so in this table is just um, sort of what their azimuth direction is and then which world quarter that would uh, correspond to. Something sort of interesting, um, all of the court kivas had an even number of pilasters. So there were either six, eight, or 10. Um, so that's sort of, sort of interesting here. So I sort of broken it out by, you know, 
if, if the kiva had 10 pilasters versus eight versus six. So the ventilator tunnel, so that's, that's this dashed line here um, that extends to the south of these court kivas. Um, they do vary slightly in orientation, as you can see here um, in this graph, with most of them being, you know, um, it's south. There are some south southeast and some south southwest, um, but they average a mean uh, a mean of just like six degrees from south. So it appears that court kivas were intended to be structured relative to a north south axis despite maybe some slight disparities relative to a true south compass bearing. But even this is quite a testament to the skill of the Chacoan builders, you know, that there was this little variation um, across these structures, you know, given the lack of modern engineering tools. I just wanna flip back to this slide real quick. Um, so given that court kivas um, were meant to lie along this north-south axis, I measured the orientation of the pilasters sort of relative to the spatial arrangement of um, the features in the kivas themselves. So with the ventilator position sort of dead south. And using this method, I found that the pilaster arrangements are exceptionally uniform across the structure. So much so that individual pilaster bearings varied an average of only two and a half degrees from one another across all court kivas. So for example, among all the eight pilaster um, court kivas, you know, pilaster number three in all of those, you know, was within about two degrees of each other. It, it was pretty amazing. Okay, so of the 140 kiva pilasters of Pueblo Benito, um, that I could, that had discernible directional orientations. Deposits from 90 of those pilasters um, were still curated um, at the museums. Again, this is, you know, these projects were done over a hundred years ago. So that in itself is, is, is pretty fortunate. Here in the top figure, you can see all of the court kivas at Pueblo Benito shaded in blue. And then the bottom figure shows those for which I could both determine their orientations of their pilasters and the, which I actually had pilaster deposits that I could access and analyze that had been curated at the museums. So in total, these deposits included over 10,000 individual objects. Um, between 2008 and 2014, I analyzed all of these materials as part of a, nat a larger National Science Foundation funded research project, which was focused primarily on the ornaments from Pueblo Benito but again, while my research was primarily aimed at the jewelry, because artifacts we would consider to be jewelry items or you know, related materials like bits of turquoise, because these types of items comprise the majority of objects that are found in pilasters, I included them in my research. Okay, so the, although the specific contents of the individual offering deposits are unique, the same general materials and forms occur re repeatedly across the site. So the most commonly represented materials are turquoise, marine shell, uh, jet, uh, shale, and various mineral pigments. Other objects um, that appeared with sort of uh, less frequency include things like gypsum and selenite, quartz crystals, uh, galena, lithic debitage, um, raptor, carnivore claws and teeth, um, bits of worked bird bone, or even some that had feathers still preserved um, and fossils. So uh, turquoise, marine shell and jet um, appeared most often um, and either as finished items, so such as a, a bead or a, a mosaic piece or maybe a broken ornament or as a debris, I think from lapidary production. So maybe like turquoise flakes or something like that. So for this analysis, um, these materials were categorized into basic color groups, white, red, black, blue, green, and yellow. Um, and you will see that there isn't yellow here. And so I will return to that um, at, at the end of the talk and sort of explain why that was. Um, and then I, I was also curious if there was any patterns with sort of a multicolored or translucent category. So I included these as well. And I also followed others in combining blue and green into a single category. 
um, as I mentioned, uh, based on sort of the conceptual and linguistic uh, intermixing of these two colors um, among historically documented Pueblos. So proportionally, turquoise and marine shell objects really dominate um, the, the deposits in terms of frequency. And this is actually not that surprising considering that these two materials are the most common materials included in ritual deposits of all kinds, not just in kivas, across the entire ancestral Pueblo world. This is a very long lived tradition, appears to have begun over 2000 years ago. Um, so, so that is not surprising. Um, so while these deposits, uh, individual piles of deposits do contain objects representing multiple um, color groups, when multiple categories are represented, white and blue green are almost always present. And then it seems that other colors are added sort of onto that base, um, sort of, you know, red than black, for example. All right, so although the objects of several different colors um, appear in most of these deposits, there were statistically significant associations between the relative frequency of artifacts of different color categories and the directional quadrant, right, or world quarter um, of the pilaster in which they were found. So some of these relationships include south with blue green, east with white, west with red. Um, black materials occur more in northern pilasters than those of other directions, although this association wasn't as statistically significant. Um, Multicolored material, which is primarily represented by abalone shell in my sample, is also more frequently found in pilasters with, of northern quadrants. Um, but again, I, there were no statistically significant associations um, just because of, you know, there were so few items in those categories. All right, sorry, just one moment here. Okay, so as another layer of directional citation, I was also curious if perhaps these pilaster deposits might be referencing not only sort of sacred directions, um, but also maybe actual physical features on the Chacoan landscape, um, maybe important landforms or raw material sources. So we know that um, prominent mountains and mesas, um, other geological formations are really ingrained in Pueblo oral history as cultural sort of cosmographic boundary markers um, and places associated with um, specific events and characters and oral history, migration histories, um, different ceremonial practices. So some of the landforms within and surrounding the San Juan Basin that are considered sacred in various Pueblo traditions include um, Shiprock, uh, Huerfano Mesa, the Jemez Mountains, Mount Taylor, um, Zuni Mountains, Cabazon Peak, the Chuska Mountains, and these are just to name a few, um, but these are some of the primary ones. And it, I think it's interesting to point out, um, so the relationship of Chacoan structures to sort of celestial cycles receives the most public attention um, I've noticed, but in, in actuality, the alignment of Pueblos and shrines to one another and to these very conspicuous physical landscape features is actually more typical of Chacoan architectural practice. So of all the pilaster orientations, um, I found that south, southeast, and west pilasters are associated with the most objects. Um, Blue-green materials are especially concentrated in south-southeast oriented pilasters. And in fact, south-southeast oriented kiva pilasters contain almost four times the amount of turquoise recovered from east, south, southeast, and east southeast oriented pilasters combined. So this suggests that this very specific direction was purposefully emphasized during the construction of these kivas. Now, this pattern I think could be connected to an older ancestral Pueblo tradition in the San Juan Basin of acknowledging this direction of south southeast through architecture. So five of the seven great houses 
Um, early great houses in the canyon, um, they were founded in the late 9th and 10th centuries, have south-southeast orientations. And actually, including Pueblo Benito um, during an earlier stage of its construction. So here on the right, you see Pueblo, a uh, plan view of Pueblo Benito. The different colors denote different construction stages with the red, this sort of um, row, arcing row of rooms being the earliest portion of the structure. And as you can see, that early structure is oriented um, south, southeast. And then over time, as um, the building was remodeled, additional rooms were added, it was slowly reoriented to more sort of a north, south, east, west um, orientation. So this uh, south, southeast sort of directional veneration, first through Pueblo layout, and then in, in these ritual offerings, I think may be linked to the position of Mount uh, Taylor. Here you can see it's circled right here in red. Here's Chaco Canyon. You can sort of see the relationship between the two. Um, so this is the highest peak south of Chaco Canyon. Um, Mount Taylor is located south southeast of much of the central basin and from Pueblo Benito. Um, it's the same orientation from Pueblo Benito as the original portion of the structure um, was when it was constructed. Um, the mountain also has a prominent role in traditional Pueblo narratives, um, sometimes even associated with the color blue green and or turquoise. Now, Kiva pilasters oriented to the west, as I mentioned, also contain a large number of blue-green materials, as do those actually oriented to the northwest. So along these directional bearings um, are the Chuska Mountains and Shiprock. So here's the Chuska Mountains and here's Shiprock. The Chuska Mountains were an important source of um, flake stone raw materials. And communities in the Chuska area also produced a significant amount of the pottery that was used by Pueblo Benito's residents. So there, there was a strong relationship between these two areas. Shiprock is this dramatic volcanic landform um, that rises sort of hundreds of meters above its surrounding area. Um, it's you know, very sort of visually stunning. It can be seen from very far away. Um, and it's been suggested by um, archaeologist Ruth Van Dyke that it may have served as kind of a visual connection point between communities north and south of the San Juan River. So here we've got sort of Chaco Canyon south of the San Juan River, then north of the San Juan River, you have sort of, you know, Mesa Verde. So we may have sort of linked these two, um, two regions. So how do these patterns in colors and directions um, at Pueblo Benito compared to those of, um, that have been documented for the Pueblos. Um, and what might, this might the implication of this be for our understanding of Chaco and cosmology? Well, Pueblo Benito's directional color scheme, at least as materialized in my sample in these court Kiva offerings, kind of both partially resembles, but also diverges from all of these. So, here you can see the color directional schemes um, of the Pueblos, and this is divided sort of by major um, linguistic group. Um, and what really stands out the most here are white and yellow, I think. So the association of white and east is shared by both Pueblo Benito and all of the Pueblos. Um, and while yellow is present in all of the Pueblo quaternary color schemes, it is not represented in Pueblo Benito's possible directional offerings. Um, now yellow pigment in the form of limonite or yellow ochre is present at the site. Um, and this is both as a raw material and also as uh, residues on grinding stones um, or, or pallets. So we know they were using um, yellow as uh, for paint at least. Um, it's also found, these yellow minerals are found in a range of contexts from sort of domestic refuse to deposits associated with burials to ritual storage areas. So it appears that yellow was this, a sort of socially meaningful color, but perhaps its value was not as sort of enmeshed in a directional or geo-ritual citation 
as these other colorful materials. So although the specific color directional associations differ right, among Pueblo Benito and the different um, uh, language groups of the Pueblos, I think what's perhaps most interesting um, is that it indicates that there is the endurance of the general cosmology in the region that continued for at least eight to 900 years after the end of the Chacoan system. So a cosmography in which the universe appears to have been divided into world quarter directions and related um, colors. There are sacred features of the local landscape and a similar suite of kind of potent or powerful um, substances like turquoise. Um, so beginning in the fourth century actually and continuing throughout the entire ancestral Pueblo and Pueblo temporal sequence, we see that turquoise, red and blue pigments and marine shell are consistently found in sort of ritualized um, contexts. And in these settings, they occur both alone and with other objects. Sometimes they're found as like finished, you know, beads, for example, or broken beads, or just, you know, maybe a flake of unworked raw material. Um, so in other words, the value of these materials appears to be unaffected by their size, the form that they take, the completeness of the artifact, or even the purity of the material. Sometimes some of these deposits even contain the turquoise matrix, right? The rock that it's found within and not even the turquoise itself. Um, so this suggests that they, these materials possess kind of, you know, intrinsic properties on their own. Um, and that these, you know, properties may have included um, perhaps powers to sanctify um, or to protect um, the structures or individuals or other objects with which they were associated. So when they were placed in these Cork Kiva pilasters, they may have sort of symbolically sort of supported and protected these really, you know, elaborate, heavy, expensive cribbed roofs of these special structures. And again, um, the timbers that were used for these roofing structures would have been brought from outside of the canyon. And this would have been on foot. There were no you know, wheeled vehicles, there were no draft animals. So there's been a lot of human labor involved in um, bringing these timbers to the canyon um, for construction. Um, both indigenous and other anthropological scholars suggest that um, in several communities, Kiva roofs um, represent both the sky and an inverted basket, and that these two concepts um, may be linked. Um, archaeologist Scott Ortman suggests that um, ancestral Pueblo Kivas in the Mesa Verde region, north of Chaco, are kind of material metaphors for containers, specifically that you know, the Kiva's walls may have been analogous to pottery bowls and the roofs perhaps to coiled baskets. Um, and in Tewa, Hopi, and Zuni cosmology, the earth is also viewed as um, a pottery bowl, so a, a kind of like a container. So in this perspective, then, a kiva symbolizes the earth, and its cribbed roof represents the sky. And so if we kind of extend this metaphor a little bit, right, kiva pilasters are kind of these and points along the horizon, right? These points along the Earth's or villages, either actual horizon or cosmographic horizon, places where, you know, the Earth and the sky intersect, sort of these significant sort of foundational points in the sort of larger um, geo-ritual landscape. So um, archaeologist Severin Fowles has demonstrated um, how the 13th and early 14th century residents of Pot Creek Pueblo, which is an ancestral Tewa and northern Tewa site um, in northern New Mexico, um, use shrines to integrate the built and natural landscape around the Pueblo and to reference sort of this larger um, sort of cosmological order. And in this case, it included sort of the ritual geometry where the world quarters were marked by shrines, by um, hills, by certain mountains, um, and that these sort of occurred at these distinct um, intervals from the village. 
So I suggest that Chaco and Kivas might map out kind of a broadly comparable relationships, but on the scale of a single structure rather than sort of an entire uh, village scape. And this is consistent, for example, with uh, the Carizan view that Kivas are representative of the greater cosmos, where the roof support posts are associated with both the cardinal directions um, and trees along which humans are thought to have ascended from the lower world or center place, which itself is represented by the Kiva. Kiva. Um, similarly, a Hopi archaeologist recently indicated that um, round Kivas uh, represent the circular universe and the celestial features by which the clans navigated um, during their migrations. So I just really briefly want to return to a point um, I made earlier that the colors and materials um, in these deposits actually may have um, uh, multiple meanings. So blue-green objects in these special caches, um, as I mentioned, were likely viewed as having sort of intrinsic properties um, that were assigned right to different kinds of substances of this color, which in Pueblo societies widely include the ability to kind of animate, um, to consecrate. Um, so with respect to world quarter directions, like Kiva deposits, these objects appear to acknowledge the Southern world quarter and this really deeply rooted four part color directional system. But on another level and more specific to the surrounding landscape, these blue green objects appear to tie Quark Kivas to the direction south, southeast. Um, the same orientation, right, cited repeatedly in the architecture of preceding periods, and which may reference, um, as I'm suggesting, Mount Taylor as a really important physical feature on the Chaco and cultural landscape. But it's also important to keep in mind that blue green objects are not restricted to these pilaster deposits ritual spaces, or even architectural context at Pueblo Benito. Turquoise was also used for jewelry items and worn um, by individuals. Um, it's buried in large quantities um, with what appear to be elite individuals um, that were buried in the structure. And then we also find turquoise sort of consistently but sparsely distributed through sort of, you know, trash deposits, refuse deposits, which suggests that you know, they were, it was being used also in sort of everyday context. So I just think it's important to keep in mind, you know, that um, I think these materials kind of have multiple meanings um, that are expressed in, in different contexts. So sort of to wrap it all up, um, I'm suggesting that the color distributional patterns in Cork Kiva pilaster deposits at Pueblo Benito seem to be conditioned by interconnected aspects of ancestral Pueblo cosmology. Um, so important and sacred directions, the physical and cultural landscape of the San Juan Basin, and also to ancestral Pueblo um, architectural traditions. Thank you. Excellent. You have tons of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, I'm just going to kind of start from the beginning and I'll work my way through them here. And some of them okay. you've answered, so I'll skip those. Um, let's see here. Um, one of the first questions was, um, was the idea of world quarters or cardinal points brought into North America or do you believe it was brought somewhere else or originated somewhere else? Well, that's a really interesting question. It's um, so, well, the color, you mean the fourfold division specifically, um, may be a result of migrations. The, in general, the assignment of directions to color seems to be a pretty universal um, aspect of human, you know, culture actually, um, which I think is is fascinating. Um, but it, you know, we believe that an evidence uh, indicates that, um, you know. Human populations migrated from Asia, right, um, over the Bering Land Bridge and down into North America and south from there. And so, you know, we see that this quaternary color scheme, like in general, the, you know, there being a four, the world quarter system is shared, right, by, by New World and Asia. So it, it could have been sort of a more deeply rooted um, idea that may have its roots 
you know, um, that could be quite old. Um, good question. <laughs> That was a cool answer too, thinking it went back so far. <laughs> um, someone else asked, and I don't think you covered it. Um, how did they, how, what are your theories on how they actually determine those cardinal points with such precision? I mean, I think they did, you know, um, I, I think they did it by looking at, you know, uh, celestial markers, by looking at the sun, by observing the stars, you know, um, we have evidence that, you know, they were keeping fairly sophisticated calendars, you know, um, the Pueblo ceremonial cycles, you know, are very dependent on the seasons and on celestial movements from solstice to solstice. And so I think that, um, you know, that kind of seasonal, um, really careful, detailed seasonal observation um, and celestial observation, you know, was, was a part of of life and it was also really essential to sort of these ceremonial cycles. Okay, we have a question. Um, someone said they had excavated a uh, Pueblo one pit structure that included Zenith and Nadir. And he said, do you know of any that have been discovered dated to the basket maker period? Um, yes, definitely. So there are basket maker um, pit houses where offerings have been found, you know, in various parts of the structure. Um, so it, you know, it looks like there are, there is a pre there are precursors to this, you know, pattern of um, uh, kiva offerings that have their roots at least in a basket maker, um, even into late archaic. Okay, one of our viewers asked, um, do Kivas have a Mesoamerican equivalent? Um, I actually do not know the answer to that. Um, I am not a, <laughs> I don't pretend to be a, Meso, uh, a Mesoamerican um, uh, specialist, but there, there certainly are a lot of connections between the two regions. And we seem to be discovering more and more as time goes on. Um, Definitely later uh, cosmology, for example, Kachina ceremonialism. Uh, there are a lot of um, shared ideas, shared symbols um, uh, between the two regions. So, um, sorry, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure of the answer to that. Okay, so we're gonna let's see here. We have a question about. How common were the translucent materials, selenite and quartz, found in pilaster deposits? Were they replacements of other color materials or were they in addition to the usual pilaster deposits? Yeah, so they were not as numerous as the other materials, but I would say they were consistently present. Um, so, you know, it was common for, say, a uh, one kiva, if you combined all the pilaster deposits, you know, there'd be at least one to three um, translucent objects, uh, mostly in the form of quartz crystals, um, but also selenite um, and uh, gypsum. The, it appears that they were added in addition to the other materials. Um, so I didn't I can't remember a case in which there were only translucent objects um, that were included in the deposit. Okay, we have a couple of questions about the origin of the marine shells. Do you mind touching on that a bit? No, not at all. So um, yeah, marine shells, obviously not local to Jaco Canyon. Um, you know, the, the closest coast is like over 800 kilometers away. Um, most of the marine shell comes from the Gulf of California area. Um, it's primarily um, Glycimerus and um, Olivella. Um, we also have some shell that's coming from, it looks like the uh, Southern California coast, Pacific coast, um, primarily abalone shell or um, ha haliotis. 
So coming from very far away. We don't yet have any evidence of any marine shell coming in from the other direction. So it doesn't look like any is coming from the Gulf of Mexico um, or other sources to the east. So it looks like it's all coming from um, the, the west, southwest. Okay, one of our questions is um, the murals, at, they, they said they, there were wall coverings at Pueblo Benito. How does that relay, like kind of relate to the findings that you, you had from the directionals and the colors and all of that? Do the, do the murals correspond to that in any way? So, um, well, some painted walls have been um, documented at Pueblo Benito. Kiva murals, uh, we really don't see that till later. Um, whereas, you know, starting in about 1300, um, sort of, you know, uh, in different portions of the Pueblo of the Pueblo region, you start to see the Kiva murals where they're like really brightly painted with figures doing things, you know, um, sort of very detailed and elaborate. Um, at this time, um, murals are still pretty geometric and simple. Um, I don't believe that there were, you know, um, murals, you know, that were commonly documented on the, on the interior of these structures though. They were, however, plastered um, repeatedly. Um, I don't know if that answers. Um, somebody asked if there were, um, if there, can you talk more basically about what the theories on what the kivas were actually, what their function was, what they were yes. being used for? Yes, yeah, so there is a debate in Southwest archaeology about kiva function. Um, it's been, you know, widely assumed that they were, there are ceremonial structures, and this is based on, um, sort of ethnographic analogs of how kivas are used among historically documented pueblos. Um, and also the fact that they have these really sort of specialized interior features. Um, so different parts of the Southwest though, um, it looks like kivas were used um, sort of slightly differently. So for example, in the Northern San Juan region, sort of the Mesa Verde region, there's much more evidence that kivas were more multi-use there. Um, sometimes being used for various purposes, sometimes even domestic purposes. Um, however, in this portion um, of the San Juan Basin, um, it's pretty solid evidence that they were used ceremonially. We don't have any evidence that they're, you know, of, of domestic use really. I mean, sometimes they're infilled with domestic trash sort of after they were um, no longer used as kivas. Um, I think all of the evidence pretty much points to sort of a, a primary ritual use of these structures. Okay, to back up just a second about the marine shells, somebody's yeah. asked why they were so important to the culture. Oh, that's man. a tough question. That's a tough question. That's a good yeah. question. Um, you know, there was a, a recent article, I wish I could remember that, um, I wish I could remember it now, but there, there was an idea that, so water has a, a prominent role in, in Pueblo oral history, sort of as being the sort of watery past um, that, uh, you know, maybe that, that shell was um, sort of associated with that, you know, as an even more powerful material as being associated with water in some way and that having, you know, a prominent place in creation stories um, in traditional history. Um, maybe also because it was exotic, because it came from a faraway place. Um, maybe because of its, not only its color, but its luster, you know, they got the sort of mother of pearl sort of, um, you know, brilliance um, to some of the shell. Um, a great question. I'm going to give you just a couple more and we'll wrap yeah. it up. Okay, um, let's see here. Someone asked if you could comment on the remains and artifacts found in room 33 in Old Chaco. Yeah, so room 33 um, is this tiny little room um, in the Northern portion of an oldest portion of Pueblo Benito. 
It's one of two mortuary crypts in this structure. So multiple individuals are buried in that room. They appear to have been of elite status based on the objects that were interred with them. Um, the, the first, uh, the earliest individuals that were buried in the room actually date to the very beginning of the structure. So they dated very early and they're two males and um, they were interred below this sort of wooden floor actually with um, just tens of thousands of um, turquoise and shell ornaments. Um, you know, it's, it's more, you know, more turquoise than we see at any other place in the entire Southwest to be sure, combined <laughs> in this one room. Um, with those two individuals. And then it looks like over time, um, individual, more individuals were interred in this one room, um, you know, spanning multiple generations. So it's thought that maybe it represents kind of like a, an, a founding lineage perhaps um, of the structure. And I kind of saved this question for last, even though it's probably, it's sort of a loaded question, but. I wanted to kind of bring it up. Someone mentioned um, the disappearance of Chaco, if you will. And I wondered if you might touch on that a little bit, um, just kind of in conclusion. Sure, yeah. So there's this um, idea, right, that, you know, the Chacoans all disappeared and it's a big mystery, but um, it actually didn't quite go down like that, at least not in terms of what we have for archeological evidence. So, um, you know, there was, people had time to leave. They, um, you know, construction kind of, new construction kind of slowly cut off at, at, at Chaco. Um, it coincides with a big drought in the Southwest that probably pay, played a part. You know, people just couldn't, um, I think it was, it, it's already a pretty kind of harsh environment, you know, pretty marginal uh, for agriculture. And so, you know, wouldn't have taken a whole lot, you know, for, uh, to kind of push people over the edge. And, you know, I, they just, I think people decided that, you know, they would be more successful somewhere else. And so people began leaving and um, moving out from Chaco to other areas of the Northern Southwest, um, sometimes joining pre-existing communities. And so, um, you know, we know that people, that they had time, you know, to sort of ritually burn structures sometimes or close up doorways, you know, um, and this probably happened over a period of time, you know, versus just like a mass exodus that was all at once. Um, many, all of the Pueblos actually um, trace their affiliation to Chaco at some point. Um, they see it as a place where multiple groups converged on the course of their migration histories. Um, and then, you know, it was one stop among many, and then they moved on to other places. Um, and so, you know, the Chacoans, um, you know, their descendants are, you know, the Pueblo peoples today, um, you know, that are still thriving communities. Um, so, you know, people moved around a lot in the Southwest, um, you know, in such a sort of, uh, you know, of an environment where there's a lot of fluctuation, you know, when you're really dependent on, on moisture, um, you know, I think that, you know, people had to be pretty nimble and pretty flexible, you know, and um, if someplace wasn't working for them, you know, um, they had relationships with other, you know, probably family connections with other groups, right, and, and, and could move out um, as needed. Well, excellent. If you have any recommended reading for any, for, for people, if they want to read more about your research, um, people were asking if there were books or papers or something that you could send them to. Yes, I have a, um, at least on the topic of the jewelry specifically of Pueblo Benito. Um, and I also analyzed the jewelry of another big Chaco and great house called Aztec Ruin, nothing to do with the Aztecs. <laughs> it's in New Mexico, it's just called uh, Aztec Ruin. Also has a huge jewelry assemblage contemporaneous with Pueblo Benito, but I did um, for my dissertation research a big comparative analysis between the two, and that is published in a journal of anthropological archaeology um, article from 2016. Um, 
And so I could send that April, the citation, if you wanted, um, if you want to send that out to people. Absolutely. Um, I can put it on our website. Yeah. And then let me think what else. Um, this, this research is published in a Cambridge Archaeological Journal article from 2022. So those are probably the two best. Great. I'll post them on our YouTube video as well. So people can go and read more if they want to. Great. So. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you all for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. There was so many, um, but hopefully you'll tune in in a couple of weeks for our next virtual lecture. And Hannah, thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> thank Have you, a great everybody. night, everyone.